<laughs> so we are here in Phoenix, Arizona for the Final Four, speaking with Coach Dave Bullwinkle, scout for the Chicago Bulls. Coach Bullwinkle, what's going on? It's nice to be here. My first Final Four was 75. Wow. Your mother didn't know your father. <laughs> exactly. I have a high school coach. I drove from <laughs> San Francisco Bay Area to San Diego, crashed at a buddy's place, and uh, joined the NB NABC. You could join as a high school coach. Absolutely. Here's how the event has changed. They played the, the four Final Four teams were Syracuse, Kentucky, Louisville, UCLA. That was Coach Wooden's last national championship. Wow. On semifinal Saturday, I walked up to the ticket booth. I bought a ticket at face value. It was not the best seat in the house. It wasn't the worst seat. Wow. Try to do that today or oh, forget two it. days from now on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Be shelling That's out about two grand. Oh. Uh, you know, yes. something like that. Yes. Yeah. Times have definitely changed, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, you go, go out and try and buy just like a hot dog now at a stand. It's like five, six dollars. You know? Oh, <laughs> man. So, Coach Bullwinkle, you got to you gotta give us a little bit like a – I said before we hopped on, you know, it, I know it's a, a lot to talk about, but just kind of take us for like a brief snippet of just your journey getting up to the Chicago Bulls um, and then just kind of what it took for you to get there. Well, I was a, a pretty good high school football and basketball player, but I'm 5'10", so I thought I had a better shot as a defensive back. <laughs> uh, so I started out at Princeton University, and I'm old enough that you had to play freshman as a freshman, and that was the same with basketball. And so actually Coach Carrill found out – I was playing on the football team, but I'd play on Sundays with some of the freshman basketball players. I could play a little. Then he tried to convince me to play on the freshman basketball team. I would have been the end of the bench guy, but I couldn't do that and keep my grades up. I didn't like Princeton. I transferred to Cal Berkeley. I was a bad football player there. I played ass back. You know what ass back is? <laughs> Every time I cl got close to the sideline, the coach said, get your ass back. <laughs> He knew he had a better chance <laughs> right. of winning if I was not in the secondary. I've never heard that. Right. I, I love that. that. So I was headed to law school, and then I decided, you know what, I don't want to go three more years of school. So in the state of California, you got to go a th fifth year. I got a master's education, and I taught and coached in high school for four years, at which point I was offered an opportunity to go as the grad assistant at Cal, and that time was the Pac-8. Mm -hmm. And uh, – I was probably making about twenty grand a year teaching and coaching, I'm guessing. The job at Cal, the grad assistant, then that was the third assistant on the staff in those yeah. days. Yep. It paid five hundred dollars. Wow. Not a month for the year it paid five hundred dollars. <laughs> so I took a ninety five percent pay cut <laughs> to I actually Bill Van Gundy, who's the fa father of Stan and Jeff, was my high school coach's best friend in coaching. And I had played against Bill's team. Stan played in high school against teams I coached. Well, I met with Bill Van Gundy, and Stan would tell you the story. Jeff was a, a ninth grader sitting at the dinner table, and we, we just – I used his father as a sounding board to decide, am I going to take this gamble or not? And I did. I rolled the dice, and it led to 25 years coaching in college. Wow. Uh, 16 as uh, an assistant, 9 as a head coach, uh, both at the Division One and the Division Two level. I got my butt fired in 2001 at St. Mary's. I hired Randy Bennett. He's done a much better job than I did. Okay? I make no bones about that. And I was out of it for a couple of years as I tried to put some other business things together. Um, really, what I started to do was a, a business that worked on teamwork development for companies, taking what I'd learned building teams as a coach sure. and putting that into the corporate sector. And I was offered a job. I was doing some part-time scouting for a couple of NBA teams. I was offered the job as the advanced X and O guy by Jim O'Brien with the Philadelphia 76ers. Obi and I were friends. We'd been young assistants at Oregon together in the late 70s. Mm. So that was my first job in the NBA. I was there one year, but the Bulls already been talking to me. And Gar Foreman, who was then their director of scouting and later their general manager, I had cut Gar from my last high school JV team. Wow. And he'd been an assistant with me when I was a Division II head coach. He convinced John Paxson to hire me, and I've been with the Bulls 19 years. I was lucky when John stepped down and Gar got let go and our tourists came in. He saw fit to keep me. My checking account really appreciates that. And so <laughs> I've been with them for four years now after 15 with John and Gar. Wow. And when I, when did you know, Coach, and I, I don't even know if I've ever asked you this, um, and I always ask coaches this, when did you know you wanted to coach? Or when did that, when did that 
start to resonate with you. Like, ah, you know, I think I might want to do this. So like, I never saw n- Alan college in the future, okay? Yeah. Coaching in college. But as a high school coach, when I stopped playing football at Cal, because there's not a great demand for aspects, <laughs> I, I needed a part-time job. And I went to work as a recreational leader on the, in this, for the city of Richmond in the East Bay near Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really liked working and teaching kids, flag football, basketball. And so I decided I wanted to teach it. I taught U.S. history and government in high school and coached football and basketball. I knew I wanted to coach. I never thought that would end up being where I was. Yeah. I went to see, I was the JV coach at this high school. Dick Edwards was the head coach at Cal Berkeley then, and I went to see Dick. He had recruited me as a player when he was the head coach at the University of Pacific, decided not to offer me a scholarship, which was a good move on his part. I went to see him if he'd be a reference for me to get a head high school job. And he says, certainly. Dave, have you thought about coaching in college? No, I never. He says, well, if you're interested, I want you as my grad assistant, out of the blue. And then one thing led to another. Wow. Wow. And that's that's perfect, too, because that, that completely, you know, just ideals, or I should say, <clears throat> you know, covers what we typically like to cover on. You know, in, in the thick of it, you went from a high school teaching and coaching position to Chicago Bulls. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, there was... There 20, was a lot in between. A lot yeah, of a lot in between. Yeah. 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 Right. But, but yeah. I'm just saying, like, yeah. you started at a high school position, and then it ultimately ended up branching into exactly to your point. Yeah. I had no idea you would get here to the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. None. None. And it's it just. It, but that's what we say all the time, right? Every like, time. we, you know, again, a lot of members, followers of Rising Coaches are young guys that are trying to move up and take that next step in advance, and, and, and we're all about that. But. Along the way, there does have to be that fearlessness of you're going to have to take a shot sometimes and not know, like, you know, oh, I'm, am I going to be here three years or five years? or not? Like, you don't know. You never and know. If there's an opportunity, you know, a, a, a friend of mine says a lot, like, the opportunity of a lifetime only exists during the lifetime of that opportunity. And so there's got to be a fearlessness that you got to have to take shots. Like you were saying, you sat at that table – and there was a there was, it was decision time. You're like, hey, I, I'm going to do this. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, you work hard, you get lucky. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but right. if you don't work hard, you're not going to get lucky. That's right. That's right. And one of the things I say to to young coaches about changing jobs when I became a, an assistant at the Division One level, I never changed jobs for money. I changed jobs for opportunity, mm. where I knew okay. And I would have a conversation with the head coach. I want to be able to do this. When I left Colorado State and went to San Jose State, one of the things with Bill Barry was that I want to handle our scheduling. Now, I know you'll make the final decisions, but laying the groundwork, because I knew that would put me in a position where I'd be talking to a lot of other coaches, yeah. a lot of assistant athletic directors, yes. who down the road they're going to be making hires. Going to be ADs, that's right. So I want to develop my skill set. Yeah. That's the reason I changed jobs. Never for dollars and cents. Yeah. No, I love that. So I always want to talk, especially on one of the pivotal things of, like, being a scout, right? So that's what you're currently in. So, of course, what are – and I, I want to preface this by saying points, assists, all those basic things that you would look for. This kid's going out there dropping 30 points a night. Like, the basic things. Um, what are some of the things that maybe you individually are like, this is what I really like in a kid, this is what I look for in, in a player? Well, I think there's three things if I go to a game. The number one thing, he, he, he doesn't have to be the best athlete on the floor. He doesn't have to be MJ. Mm-hmm. The phrase I use, he has to have a requisite level of athleticism to play in the NBA. He can't be me or Allen. Okay, that's just not going to work. <laughs> yeah, especially me. <laughs> Most players in the NBA have one thing to get them into a game. Now, the great players, LeBron, Steph, the Greek freak, they, they do a lot of things. Right. But most players, you think about, one thing gets them there. Steve Kerr made a living in the NBA because he could shoot the three. Kenneth three could get rebounds. Okay, so there's one. So I'm trying to identify what's the one thing this guy can do that's going to get him into the game. And then I'm looking at the intangible side of it. All the little things. Does he play hard? I never want to sit behind the benches. I want to sit on the other side of the court. That's the same as I did as a high school. When yeah. I was a, a, evaluating high school players as a college coach in recruiting, yeah. I want to be able to see how they behave and how they 
the act. Uh, yeah. When I come to a game, and Alan knows this because when he was at Ohio State and I was doing this job, yeah, I'm at the game an hour and a half before. At least. It pisses yeah. me off the buildings that won't let you in an hour and a half before. Now, some of those, especially because I, I, I see games all across the country, but I live in Berkeley, California, so I certainly see more games west of the Rockies. I know the places I can get in and how to get in because – I think before the game starts, I've done half my job. If I'm watching a kid that may only get three jump shots in a game, I've probably watched him shoot 200 jump shots in warm-ups. Mm-hmm. And I can move around and see it from different angles to see is, is that stroke broke or is with a little work, he could be a better shooter. Now, then I'm going to Allen, the assistant coach. I'm saying, Allen, Billy Bob over here, yeah. will he let you tweak his shot? Right. Because some guys won't. Yeah. Some guys won't. And then they're never going to get any better. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm talking to coaches, strength coaches, trainers, you name it, trying to gather information. That's all before the game ever starts. That's part of my job is to do that. Yeah. Talk about this, Coach, because I think college coaches um, can really benefit from this, especially now in the age because so many recruiting situations happen faster. You know, the, the season ends, guys are right to the portal and visits. So the DNA or the nature or the humanity of who's coming in the building is such a big deal. And obviously that scales really down when there's only 440-some jobs at your level. So talk about the importance of doing that intel and that background and, and, and how it can burn you if you don't do it. Some of it's answers you get from people. We all know that some coaches are going to lie to you because they're trying to help their kids. They're just trying to, that, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Right. But I, I have to know who those people are. <laughs> exactly. The other thing is I often ask someone, well, he's a really hard worker. Well, tell me a story that illustrates it. Tell me a story that illustrates his relationship with his teammates. Yeah. Because it's harder to lie in a story. Okay. <laughs> right. So, for example, when <laughs> right. I finish here this weekend on Monday, I'm flying to Denver and going to Boulder and spending a whole day there doing background work with everybody from the academic advisor to the managers Yeah, on the players at Colorado that might be in the draft this year, obviously mm-hmm. starting with Phoenix native Cody Williams. So those things are really important to know. Yes. And sometimes you do it by observation. Yeah. So I'm watching uh, Carolina play in the ACC finals when Cody – when Kobe White, the place for us, was on the team. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I watch him, and he's so happy on the bench when teammates have success. And in this day and age, yeah, a lot of players are not happy for their teammates' success. Oh, I know. Like, when's I've it going to be my turn? Right. Yeah. So I've told that to Kobe. Part of the reason we drafted you yeah. was because of that. I'm at the Pan American Games, and Denzel Valentine is playing – for the USA team, Mark Fuse coaching the team, mm-hmm. and Denzel's not getting in the game hardly at all. But there's timeouts, and they don't have any managers stuff. He's grabbing the water and bringing it to the guys that are on the court. That said a lot to me about Den- wow. Denzel Valentine, marginal player in the NBA. Yeah. All right. But he was a team-oriented guy. Who's now become a terrific young coach. Yes. Yeah. And so in the case of Kobe, I've told Kobe that. All right. True story. We – Three years ago, we don't have a first-round pick. We have a second-round pick. And we're talking about a bunch of guys, including Io from Illinois. We break for lunch, and Kobe's down on the court shooting. So I go down to see Kobe. Because for the, on the U18 team two years before, I guess it was three years before, whatever it was, Bill Self's coaching the team, and Io's on the team, mm-hmm. but so's Kobe. So I went to Kobe, and I said, Kobe, let me ask him. When you play on that team, if you could pick one guy on that team to be a teammate, who would it be? He says, Io. Now, I have no idea who's going to say. He says, Io. He has no idea. We've just been talking about Io. Yeah. He says, Io. I said, why? He says, because all he cared about was winning. I said, you mean there's some guys that cared more about their numbers than winning? Oh, yeah, coach. <laughs> right. And, and he and I were thinking about a couple of the same guys <laughs> whose names I will not mention. Right. <laughs> that's part of the reason we draft. I went back. Our meeting started up again. And I said, I want you to know what Kobe just said to me. I've got my ears always open. I'm just smart enough to know I'm stupid. 
Yeah. I want to hear what other people have to say. Yeah. And learning those things are so valuable because yeah. you're trying to put your team together. Yes. No, you know, I, one of the things I used to love to do when I'd go to a high school, I used to love to talk to, like, the, the maintenance crew or, like, no a question. custodian and just say, hey, man, tell me about so-and-so. And usually I would get the same words but two totally indifferent reactions in a totally different context. Usually they would say, oh, that kid. And if they said, oh, that kid with a smile on their face, then I'm ready for something yeah. good that's coming. So if they rolled their eyes back and said, oh, that kid, the same three words. But the second, re the, the second reaction is not good usually. And, but I always wanted to know, how does this person treat someone that cannot impact their future? Mm. Because this guy just keeps the, the court clean and, the, you know, opens the doors, locks the doors. How are you treating this person that has zero impact on your future? I couldn't agree more. That's the reason. When I go to visit campuses, and we started doing this after we made a mistake in the first-round pick one year. And we were working the phones like everybody. Yeah. But Matt Lloyd, who's now with the Timberwolves, Matt and I decided, you know, we need to do this face-to-face -face so we can see – just what you're saying, the yeah. body language and the that, reaction. That's right. And it's harder to lie to you face-to-face. -face. Right. So when I go to campuses, the most important people we need to talk to are the strength coaches. Yeah. Because oftentimes they're not wedded to that player because they didn't have anything to do with recruiting. And oftentimes they were hired by the university, not by the head coach. Right, right. And they have, and strength coaches have a different approach to work than basketball completely coaches. yes so strength coaches and managers yeah because managers were in the locker room with them right so I'll, i want to talk to as many managers that will sit down and talk with me yeah you know and earlier you were talking about providing uh added value i'm at florida state doing work on Dwayne bacon and malik beasley and i'm talking to four managers and one of them uh chris is just a, a really really top flight guy unbeknownst to me four years later he's working for us and now he works for the trailblazers because chris was always looking to find anything he could do extra to help the team yeah yeah at florida state for ham right with the chicago bulls for several different head coaches who kept him because he was so good and he worked his way up wow and now he's on the bench with the trailblazers how about that yeah no i mean it, it's great to like be able to <clears throat> see the people grow throughout, you know, but like, especially just being, or I, I, sh I, I have a thought in my head and I'm trying to like get to how I'm trying to get there. Yeah. Basically like when, when you're working with kids for prime example, going back to what you said before, I have a kid on my team now. I'm current uh, assistant coach at division three school in Pittsburgh, Chatham university. And we have a kid, one of our, our bigs. Okay. Probably the tallest and biggest kid on our team. And should he be seeing me more time? Maybe, maybe not, you know, but he's the kid. Timeouts, you know, Division Three. we don't necessarily have the managers that Division One has. Water bottles, usually I'm the one to go over and grab them, hand them out. He, he always goes and gets water bottles, gets towels for the guys. And I'm sitting there, and I asked him a couple times. I was like, look, I love that you're doing it, you know, but I, I don't want, I want you listening to the conversation, so I kind of take it off of him a little bit. But he, he gets the initiative, and he looked at me one time, and he goes, no, no, no. I want him, even though if I'm not playing the minutes, I want to be a part of this team somehow. So, wow. So, Doug, if I came to your game to watch players and it's before the game, the question I'm going to ask you is, when they come in the gym to practice, who's the one that makes you smile the most? Because, you know, every day he's going to bring his A game. Yeah. He's going to listen. He accepts constructive criticism, all those factors, right? And if you tell me two or three players and you haven't got to the guy that I'm there to see yet, then I got a question. How come you haven't mentioned Allen's name? Yeah. Well, you know, he's, yeah, but, okay. That's the way I try to learn. Like I said, just smart enough to know I'm stupid. <laughs> Ask right. open-ended questions. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. absolutely. Now, do you feel that, or have you seen in the past, like, you see a kid, maybe he doesn't have exactly what you're looking for. Can you work him or uh, morph him into something, I guess? Maybe not necessarily personality-wise, but do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, have you ever seen a kid and you're like, all right, well, he's a great player. Um, personality, he could be there. Maybe we can work with him and get him into something. And how would you kind of work him into that? I think it's easier to work with him on the skill set than it is on the personality set. By the time we get him, and it's not quite the same for high school coaches. Yeah. By the time we get him, my phrase is, if he's born square, he's not going to die round. 
And when Allen's coaching at Ohio State, the players they got there, all right, if you're trying to save guys and be a social worker, one out of 100 are going to save. The other 99 are going to get your ass fired. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I can tell you guys that I – players i said i can tell you players that i said to our organization no we don't want him now i hope he proves me wrong because he's an 18 19 20 year old young man i yeah. hope he figures it out yeah but i don't think we should invest a draft pick in him because yeah. the odds are against it yeah and i can tell you a few that did figure out most of them don't now what's that go back to well you gotta go back to mom and dad i want to find out about mom and dad yeah okay so I mentioned Cody Williams earlier, right? And Cody's brother is obviously a really good second-year player for OKC. And Jalen's having a hell of a year. Is it just coincidental that both parents were in the military? No, it's not. Yeah. All right? That's not happenstance. Right. So I want to find out. One of my questions always is, greatest adversity the kid ever faced and how did he deal with it? Yeah. Because I want to find that out. Some guys had a silver spoon in their mouth all their life. Right. They, can't, now, they don't even have to answer that question. Now, when we draft him and you got to you got to go down and play in the G League and you're going to be on a bus, <laughs> how do you respond? Or right. you got to go to the G League and you're 19 years old and there's some 29-year-old retread and you're trying to take his minutes yeah. and take it, the money out of his yeah. mouth. He got two kids. He's going to knock family. you on got, your yeah. rear end. He got two, he got he got, two kids. Yeah, that's that, right. He's trying how to. do you respond when that happens yeah, to right. you? Right, right. I want to find that out as best I can. Yeah. I, I'm not a social worker. I don't. We have a psychologist that works with players and stuff. I think he got a better chance to improve his jump shot than his competitiveness. I'll go to the flip side of this, Coach. Like, how many guys – you know, you study them through college, and how many guys – I won't say how many, but how how often would you say a guy will make it in the NBA because of maybe not being a, the, a, the uh, top-flight talent, but his professionalism exceeds his talent. But when you put the two together, he's a great fit. No question. Like so, like you know what I mean? Because and it goes at the end of their careers too. Yeah. Oh, they're yes. Taj Gibson. Like Mike Muscala's still in the league for a reason. Right. Like from right. Bucknell. Right. Like I, I thought he was gone. I turned on OKC the other night. He's running up and down the floor. So I, I know. <laughs> I thought he was gone. T- I've seen him since San Antonio. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like Mike Muscala's still playing. So we drafted drafted Taj Gibson. Yeah. And Taj is still in the league. Right. And we talked last year. And, and was out for a bit. Yeah. Should we sign Taj just to be a locker room influence? And that's the reason he ended up back in the league, because people have such – he's a professional. Yes. He knows he's not as good as he was. But if you have to put him in the game, he's coming every night ready to play if you need him. Yes. He's going to be a pro in the locker room. He's yeah. going to be a good influence on the younger players. Taj Gibson, I mean, there are players like that. There's some guys, I'd want them on my roster, but they can't date my daughter. And some guys can date my daughter, but don't want them on my roster. Right? Taj is both. Both. He fits both. That's and, right. And when Joe Kim Noah played for us, I told Joe one time, I said, Joe, I wish you'd date my daughter. And it'd piss her husband off, but I wish – and he starts laughing. At me. <laughs> the point is, Joe, I can't say anything better about a player. Yeah. Then I wish you'd date my daughter. Right. And Joe was a great player also. Yeah. Because he, he was all about winning. Oh, yeah. Ultimate so, connector. Ultimate. Yeah. So you're looking for those guys. Yeah. Right? Now, sometimes you'll overlook some of the flaws because the guy is so talented. But yeah. lots of times they'll bite you in the butt down the road. Yeah. And that's the one thing, too. Like, locker rooms are, I feel like, sometimes overlooked. The, the locker room chemistry, especially it, it maybe I'll speak for at least for me at the lower levels, um, just because for, oh, for prime example, like I went to a Cavs game recently. I'm from Ohio and, and a Cavs fan and <clears throat> Tristan Thompson got brought back. Now, he's one of those guys in 2016. He was a pivotal role for the Cavs, right? right. Getting a ton of offensive rebounds, defensive rebounds. Didn't do anything else. Well, not necessarily as much you know, picking rolls and lobs just from LeBron and other guys, but now he's back. And I went to a Cavs game about a week ago. And the first thing I'm sitting there, I, I went with my dad, and I'm sitting there, and I was like, he goes, I don't even know Tristan Thompson came back. I was like, yeah, he came back, but I'm not sure why. And I watched the game, and exactly to your point, first time out, he was at half court. 
He wasn't even in. Didn't even play the first half. At half court, giving everybody high fives and saying, hey, hey. And then he pulled one of the guys aside and starts pointing around. I, I looked at my dad and I go, I think that's why he's back. Like, he, he's a player coach. And you're 100% correct. Yeah. You need those people. Oh, my gosh. It makes such a difference, especially room. if you have young guys. Okay? And in the case with the Cavs, Evan Mobley. Evan's father played for us when I was a Division II head coach. And I know that family well. Mm -hmm. And Evan's a wonderful guy, but he's young. Yeah. yeah. So he needs a veteran like Tristan talking to him. One of my concerns about Evan, he's just too damn nice. Because in that family of the two boys, Isaiah is the alpha dog. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. was Evan going to be demanding enough of the balls? Now, if I'm sitting in the shoes of the coaching staff with the Cavs, I'm hopeful that that's one of the things Tristan Thompson is talking to Evan about, who's a 22-year-old <laughs> budding star. Yeah. Crazy. But – Demand the ball. Tell yeah. them to give you the ball. Right. 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 You, some young big guys don't do that. Yeah. yeah. And I think Evan's going to be a great player. Okay. Great player. Yeah. Uh, but I was lucky when I coached his father. His father was a very good player and, and, and now is a very good coach. Uh, he has a choice. He could, I yeah. think he can stay at USC or go to SMU with Andy. Uh, but having that older guy to help the young player grow. I yeah, really, and help him to, to learn how to be a pro. I, one of my first or second years with the Bulls, we we got knocked out of the playoffs. I'm back. We're getting ready for the draft, and uh, Luol Dang was playing for us then. Mm. And Luol Dang had taken a few weeks off after after we got knocked out, but now he's back, and he's in our practice facility, and he's with a coach working on his game for two hours in the morning, and he comes back in the afternoon and he lifts for an hour and a half. And he come back at night, and he's got a couple buddies, and he's paying for them to where they can live. But the real reason he's doing it, they shag balls for him. And he comes back and shoots for two hours. <laughs> That's what guys do oh, if goodness. you want to be a pro. That's yeah. right. And I can give you a list of players who love the NBA lifestyle yeah. but didn't love the NBA work style. Right. And they either didn't become as good as they should have been or they fell out of the league really quickly. Yeah. And it's like my second year in the league, and I'm seeing Luau do that, and it was – you know, a great illustration of what you have to do in the off season if you want to be a, as good as you can be as a basketball player. It doesn't – these guys aren't trying to get drafted. They're trying to have a career. Yeah, that's a big and difference. unfortunately, in yep. this day and age, too many just want to get drafted because somebody's in their ear saying, you're ready, you're ready. Even, even at the lower levels, the amount of kids that I hear that say, oh, I, I want to go make it pro. And I was like, well, NBA is yeah. – Yeah, sure about sport. that? Like, like overseas <laughs> – Overseas, okay, there's an option. Like, there's there's Division three kids that I've I've coached that are playing overseas right now, or even that I've been around. But it's just like, you don't realize. Hard now. <laughs> you really don't. One percent of what was the statistic? One percent of high school basketball players make it on to college. What's the percentage from college to pro? I probably like point. You know, like you got better chance to be elected president. <laughs> <laughs> so I, if I'm talking to high school guys in the summertime when I work some camps, and I'll, okay. You go to the NBA game? Oh, yeah. I, I, when you go to the NBA game? Well, I get their tip. Come an hour and a half before when the first bus. There you, you know go. That's talking. the, yeah, right. Early bus, bus late second bus. So have a That's first right. bus or the guys that don't play so much. And the second yeah. bus comes 45 minutes later with the, the guys that play the most. All right. The, when those first bus guys are working out, and that's some guy, you're clowning him because he gets no burn at all. He was somebody's All-American. Now, you come in, and 90 minutes before the game, I was at Golden State and uh, – and the Mavs on, on Tuesday night. And I'm there early watching this stuff, and I'm watching this guy, a first bus guy, and he's dropping 12 straight corner threes. And you're a high school guy. You can't hit the rim from there. You don't realize <laughs> how good these – Absolutely. So, so, Doug, in, in my job, so my job's the draft. I don't – my job's not to scout the NBA. But I try to see t two NBA games live – every month and for me that's usually at golden state because i live across the bay from san francisco i'm going to keep in mind where the bar is even though i've done this a long time i got to keep in mind how big fast strong and good these guys really are oh my god i'm watching all these college guys i can see you play against allen and you're better now way better but do you have a chance to guard steph or luca who's in that game or no, I have to keep that in mind. Yeah. So if you're a young player, go see those kids early because getting in our league, <laughs> it ain't easy. And then some of it is, are you willing to accept your role 
I was talking to Greg Anthony who was doing the game for TNT the other night before mm-hmm. the game. He was talking about one of the things he really thinks is good about Dallas is, you know, everybody knows Kyrie and Luca. Yeah. But they got guys that have accepted their roles, okay? Whether Absolutely. Whether it be Dwight Powell as a backup or whether it be Daniel Gafford being a rim runner yeah. and a rim protector. He's not going to step out and shoot the three. He's not a pick-and-pop guy. He accepts what he does, and that's part of the reason he's a really good player. So you need to find out, are guys willing to accept their role? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not ever going to be a star. No. No, no doubt. Well, I mean, it was you who said the other day. It was a statistic, Al. Uh, it, was, it was a couple weeks ago, but I don't know why that's stuck in my head. I forget the exact numbers, but you said the amount of people in the NBA that are role players is astronomical. I forget the exact number. Yeah, I mean, uh, if there's with this 440 some jobs, I'd say probably 40, 25 stars, 20 to 30 stars. Yeah, I would say so. And then after that, you're a role player. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially even on a college roster, like essentially identical. You know. Yeah. And, but I the the last question I have for you, Coach, and, and I I may be wrong in this, but I don't think I am, so I'm gonna ask it anyway. Can college coaches at all levels but especially if you have maybe guys that have a chance to play but i think college coaches can do a better job of coaching and teaching professionalism just for the sheer sake of you're going to be a professional at some point anyway now if you happen to get paid to play that's a different form of being a professional but you can you can is is building professionalism into your culture but we both know and how important that is because the today with the NIL and the portal, yeah. it's getting harder and harder to hold players accountable. For sure, because there's a move. For so sure. right. my standard question when I see officials in the airport, and some of these guys officiated games that I coached in a long time ago, you've had a lot of coaches that have been assholes. Have you had a player been an asshole? And three years ago, yeah, geez, not really. Or or maybe that that Bullwinkle guy, he's a turd. Yeah. I asked that question of an official early this year, and he says, oh, Dave, the coaches can't control them now, and neither can we, because the portal and the NIL, they won't listen to anybody. Now, that's not true of every player. Don't get me wrong. Right, right. right. But a much higher percentage, Allen and Doug, right. than used to be. Yeah. Used to be. Yeah. And so it makes, that makes it harder for the college coach. Yeah. Because, you know, you talked about the portal and guys leaving early. I've talked to several college assistants this week who aren't here for the convention, mm-hmm. would like to be here, Yeah, but they're having to work the portal stuff right now. Right. To try right. to figure out their roster for next year. Yeah, the yeah. season ends and the portal opens a day, right day or two later, so you go right for, no you know. No question. Yeah. And, and, and this event, is the, the convention, is so important for college coaches that I think that the NCAA has to do something yeah. to make this a dead period not just to be off campus, but maybe even use the phones. We know peop- some people will circumvent that. I understand that. Right. But it hurts coaches that can't be here. Yeah. It well, hurts I, you because they're I, guys you can't interview you'd like to be talking to. I know coaching staff are going to be huddled up tomorrow doing Zooms during the day Yep. before they hang out in the afternoon I mean, because they're doing recruiting Zooms, you know, just for four or five hours. So. No, it is crazy. Well, I mean – do you guys have any final comments or snippets? Well, away? selfishly, yeah. yes. Take it away. Coach, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Um, your friendship to me is, is pure gold, man. I, I appreciate you so much because I think, I, I think it's actually even better because we've never worked together. So there's never <laughs> been a – you, you never had to put up with me. But I'm, no, but I'm saying that in a sense of like there was never something on the other end – it's just been a relationship and a friendship of just enjoying and talking basketball and talking about the game and just, you know, uh, jokes about the past, you know, and how we met. And so, I, honestly, it's just been so good to, to have a relationship with you for now 34 years. So, Thank truly you. appreciate you, man. I feel the same way. It's been a game that's been great to us. Yeah. Right? I have never had to work a day in my life. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I, mean, I love what I do. I love teaching the game. Yeah. I mean, I go back and work with kids in the summer on the court. It's the only time I really get to teach nowadays. Yeah. But I go work for Don Showalter with USA Basketball. Yeah. I do some clinics for them, but I also work Don's camp in Iowa. I can be on the court. Now, it may be a guy that can't 
dribble and shoot gum at the same time. You're right. But you know what? You're teaching basketball. Yeah, that's yeah. You're that, working that, with elite players. That's a or, dopamine shot for you. Yeah. Yeah. So my wife says to me, David, why do you go to the middle of no place Iowa for <laughs> basketball? Because it's the only time I get to do it. It's, it is the highlight of the summer. Absolutely. It's not the doggone summer league. I guarantee you that. <laughs> right. It's exactly right. Yeah. And, but, uh, and the friendships that have come out of it. I mean, I, I'm going to see a bunch of friends here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, on Saturday when the games are played, I will not be in the stadium, but I'm going to be at a friend's house who was an assistant for me at one time. Nice. Who lives here as a high school coach. We're going to hang out. He's bringing some other other basketball people I know from Phoenix. Yeah. We're going to all tell lies to each other. Right. <laughs> exactly <laughs> you right. Know, the coaches are just like the players. You get a bunch of players together, oh, first yeah. liar don't stand a chance. So yeah, no doubt. 15. I average 20. I average 30. Right. Same no, I had 300 coaches. wins. No, 350. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the same deal. <laughs> You're 100% correct, Al. But, uh, but no. It's great to us. Yeah, thank you for I'm stopping lucky. by, Coach. Yes, this sir. was a blast. Thank you. It was my privilege. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I was Coach Dave Bullwinkle, current scout with the Chicago Bulls. Thanks, Coach.